Good afternoon, everyone. I'll start again. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Toys for Engineers webinar on decarbonization and the Green Deal. You're all very welcome. Uh, my name is Ken Thomas. I'm the head of School of Engineering here at Waterford Institute of Technology, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Uh, just to briefly give you some background information, we in WIT have worked in very close partnership with Waterford Chamber over the past eight years to grow the annual Toys for Engineers event. Uh, the original ambition was to inform companies in Waterford City about engineering innovation in the context of making a, making a better world, including a physical expo of new technologies. Obviously, COVID forces all to have a bit of a rethink over the last two years, so the physical expo wasn't possible, but we, uh, we have moved online and we have expanded to a full week of activities that aim to make a positive impact on the city, the Southeast, and indeed nationally. Um, we, we've, we've had a lot of activities already this week, including skills training, jobs fairs, speed networking, Three conferences over the past three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and they're all available online to watch. We have today's event, obviously, and then tomorrow we have a career session for secondary school students in the Southeast with over 700 registered already. So you can see that the scale of what we're trying to do over the week and hopefully the positive impact it makes on, on everybody. When we started the plan this year's event, uh, it was obvious we would include decarbonization and the Green Deal as a key element. It's on everybody's minds and indeed central to everything we will all do in the coming years. We have a tremendous lineup of speakers for this webinar and extremely thankful to them for giving up their time from their very busy schedules. The next 90 minutes is focused primarily on the context, the targets, the challenges of making Waterford carbon neutral by 2040. Our audience is mainly from the business community in the city and the wider region. But there are many others online who are also keen to get information on how they are contributing and can contribute to the necessary journey. We're going to start with a message from Minister Eamon Ryan, Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications and Minister for Transport, quite a brief. And his presentation will help us set the global, national, local context for today's event. Uh, we are very grateful that he's taken time to record the following short video. Hello. I'd like to wish everyone well in this event being organised by Waterford Chamber on decarbonising Waterford City and County. I'd also like to say well done to the city and county in being recognised as the best place to live in Ireland. I think we should go with that and decarbonise, go even further, making it the best place to live in Europe, if not the world. That, I think, is behind the climate plans we have to make. It's about thinking about home about our own place, our own local area, our own local environment, thinking big globally, but also bringing it back home. I've always said, my colleague Mark O'Cossey and Grace O'Sullivan, I've always said to them, I think Waterford has the potential, maybe more than any other Irish city, to really lead out the decarbonisation we need to take. If you look at it, the size, compact size and nature of the city, the room for growth, those developments, particularly along the North Keys, and, and, and in the surrounding areas where we could really build compact development close to the centre, facilitated by the public transport projects, new bridge, and moving at the railway station, which we're supporting in the Department of Transport within government. Take what's happened in the Greenways and really double down on it, connecting from New Ross all the way to Dun, Dun, Dungarvan and every other way in between. I think there's real potential in that local development of public realm to actually create a living space that's a joy to be, have your, raise your family in, to have a job in, send your children to, to school in, and decarbonise at the same time. And also to look at new industry. I've always been very impressed by WIT and the expertise they, they have in how we use new smart systems, how we take maybe the foresters there and look at Waterford County, how we could make it an ideal location for being truly origin green in how we produce food, how we manage tourism, how we welcome visitors and people to live in our city. Wish you well today in your deliberations. We're willing to give every support we can within the Department of Climate Action, Environment and Communications, as well as Transport. I look forward to hearing more about what you decide and come to, come to uh, think about delivering today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I think that sets the scene very nicely for us here today. Um, 
I'm now going to invite our first uh, main speaker, Michael Walsh, CEO for Waterford and City Council, to make his presentation. We're very grateful to, to Michael and, and his colleagues for sponsoring today's event, for the Council for sponsoring today's webinar. And it's a very exciting team, a time for the city, as, as, as referred to there by the Minister, in being the best place to live in Ireland. We kind of knew that ourselves anyway, but it's nice to have it officially recognised, Michael. So over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, I noticed the title of the, the, the overall webinar speaks of experts, um, and I don't consider myself to be an expert, I can assure you, in this space. Uh, but I do think we are at a sort of a, a point in the journey of Waterford that is exciting in many respects. And I, I think this whole decarbonisation issue is going to be a very significant part of our future. And I think I agree with the Minister completely. I think we have a particular opportunity. I don't know whether people would know or not, but we have sought designation at national level uh, as a decarbonising zone, and we're the first and only city to do so. Uh, and that's really significant um, because it, in a sense, give us, gives us an opportunity. You see up in the left-hand corner of that uh, slide there, the Waterford brand into the future, which is actually Waterford Find Your Future. And that's to speak to quality of life, speak to the opportunity, speak to... Uh, the essence of the place in many respects. We want people to be prepared to come here, invest here, live here, and do all the other things. And we see the whole issue of climate neutrality in many respects as being central to that. If we were honest about it, we've looked at this seriously a number of years ago. We felt the timing wasn't quite right uh, to make the commitment, but we actually believe we're at a tipping point in terms of even public demand in this respect at the moment. And as a consequence, uh, we are going to go at this with gusto as the way I describe it over the coming years. And we're now currently, in a sense, getting our head around how we'll do this. I know everybody wants things to happen quickly, but the reality is we're gearing ourselves to be up and very well dressed for 2022 to really start making strides in terms of this. What you see there is a roadmap to carbon neutrality. That's only the first page of what is very a very, very draft document that we're preparing at the moment. And that's looking at how we're going to actually go about the nuts and bolts of this. So Dean, if you don't mind, we'll just move it on a little bit. And um, this is a bit of context um, and it's a really simple expression in many respects. Um, by way of estimate, and these are national figures that are interpreted, if you know what I mean, in the context of water, but we're consuming or creating the consumption of carbon at the order of 7.6 tonnes per person at the moment. The ultimate goal there has to be zero net, if you know what I mean. Uh, we're saying there a target of three tonnes per person by 2030 is a realistic target, but um, that may not be ambitious enough or may be too ambitious. Um, there is an argument that we should be seeking net, net zero in some respects by, by 2030. And that's something we're, we're currently sort of deliberating on is the way I'd put it. If I was to put a wider context on this, it is the reality that this is going to take significant investment, uh, significant investment by businesses, uh, by the public sector, by householders in many respects. And one of the great challenges in it is going to be how that is going to be funded. There's a really significant part of it that ultimately is, is a cost saving in its own right, direct cost saving in many respects, and then obviously environmentally cost saving as well. So the great challenge in this whole question is how do we create this transition, give it engine, and how do we get people to join us on the journey? And this will be a really significant journey. Dean, if you can just... So the way what we're looking at here is very simple. We're trying to give this an expression in terms of it being an action plan and how we're going to go about this in many respects. And what we're looking at is uh, six program groups where we're sort of focusing. Business is sort of intertwined in an awful lot of those, and a, very briefly speak to that at the moment. 
And then we talk about the enabling measures that can do it. And this is ultimately going to lead out, lead out to a really comprehensive action plan that we'll be consulting with people over the next couple of months. Uh, and equally, that's going to need a good lot of resources. Dean, if you can again. So this is a really, really simple expression of the areas around which we sort of intend to organize ourselves. So certainly that's our current thinking. Um, the ones that will be of most interest here in some respects are carbon neutral businesses and services. In fact, I go as far as saying I think the business sector is leading in this area at the moment in many respects. It is uh, an awful lot of businesses in terms of their branding and otherwise one the green badge, if you want to put it that way. And certainly the larger scale corporate entities, I would think are, uh, if not exemplars of absolute best practice, they're, they're certainly on the road and, and making the journey. And the challenge for us is to, is to have everybody in this space uh, aware of it, starting to put their plans in place, concentrating on the low hanging fruit, obviously in the first instance where there's best to return, but equally going there. Um, the carbon neutral homes are simple enough. Obviously, an awful lot of our homes are old in that construction, if you want to put it. Thankfully, all new homes are to a standard now that are going to create a problem. But the reality is we have a lot of older housing stock. It's the inherent nature of any city or a, any urban area. And retrofitting of those is going to be a significant challenge, but equally a significant opportunity because there's a whole host of investment and business going to be there. Uh, in terms of doing that over a period of time. The carbon neutral travel, how we get ourselves around the place, energy consumption, when you look at the overall proportions of energy consumption, travel and the burning of diesel and petrol is a really significant contributor. We simply have to do that more sustainably. You'll be all aware of the national intent around the electrification uh, of our car fleet and indeed broader fleet uh, but equally the ultimate objective is actually to minimize travel and that's around sustainable planning and a lot of other things the sustainable consumption piece is about how we live it's everything from what waste we generate where we buy our food every other thing in terms of our daily existence how we do it and otherwise and i think in a way that reflects what in all of these is going to be a phenomenal um behavioural change programme that's going to be needed. And it's our objective, obviously, to help lead that behavioural change by not forcing ourselves on anybody, but a bit like it, do I describe it, the vaccination or the, the COVID programme here in Ireland, it's about getting people on board, about them, and giving them information and they acknowledging the need to do this and that we join all together in terms of this journey together. You have experts here from the renewable energy fields. Uh, we're going to have to develop a lot more renewable energy sources locally. And then equally, we have to increase urban resilience. And that's about uh, making sure that we're adapting to climate change in terms of flood protection and otherwise. But equally, it speaks to sequestration and offsetting and making sure that we have sustainable living spaces, green areas, and everything else in our city. I think we're we're blessed in many respects with that as we speak. This is the big piece in many respects to give people context to the ambition, because if we want to make all those things happen in all those areas, we simply have to have an engine to drive it. We probably need a center of excellence where we would be looking at having maybe 30 people leading out on this, uh, experts in their different areas and particularly in these areas. And if I'm honest, Walford City and Council don't have an awful lot of expertise. We have a few people, really good people, with a very limited number at the moment. And we need people in terms of the behavioural change pieces, citizen engagement that would be never like it was before, uh, finance experts, some engineers, I suppose, in many respects, given the title of this programme, uh, but it's a wide range of skills that are need, need to come together to actually drive this out, to engage with the community and make things happen. That doesn't come without costs. We think two or three million a year will need to be spent. We will certainly are engaging with national government. I think our council, once we rationalise it, will be prepared to 
uh, contribute something in terms of funding, of course. And equally, we'll be looking to Europe, and Grace will probably speak to a little bit of that, where there is it's certainly a major shift in funding towards uh, the just transition or towards the whole Green Deal scenario. Uh, and in a sense, there's opportunity there once we, once we gather ourselves to do it. But it does need that real engine over the coming years and starting immediately in 2022 if we are to uh, really drive this project. It will need innovation. The likes of WIT will be core partners with us. The likes of uh, Waterford Chamber and all businesses will be reaching out to businesses to give them and deliver them services and expertise, uh, but equally to encourage them to join this. But we'd like to be a movement, to be honest about it, more than uh, a club or a, a, a thing. The real success here will become will only come with the buy-in of all our citizens, all our businesses, and otherwise that we become team waterfront in many respects delivering this. It won't be done easily. I've seen the figure, for example, of uh, this change requiring an investment of about 10,000 per head of population. In our terms, that's about 500 million. But that money is actually not uh, in any sector sense uh, that the individual needs to be doing it, their investment decisions that businesses, that householders, that the public sector ourselves will all be contributing to. Uh, and that will require new approaches, simple things like if it doesn't make sense currently, financial basis to retrofit your house, for example, or your business um, over a short term financing model will can it be achieved that we do it over a long-term financing model, for example? And there are going to be great challenges in that context, but there are equally great opportunities. There's a lot of capital in the world at the moment, and in Ireland indeed, and the challenge is how we transition that capital into really effective outcomes for this overall program. So, Dean, if you, if you can, um, we have, as, a, as I said, key partners here, uh, WIT in TUS is really significant and the development of the technological university and it finding a space and partnership with us in this and using the abilities and skills that already exist there in terms of testing us, researching us and indeed being core partners in this is absolutely critical. But equally in terms of business the sector, the likes of the chamber and others will be core partners in terms of us delivering this together our communities will have to become core partners. So I just finished by saying this is absolutely, uh, this is absolutely ambitious. Um, it requires phenomenal change, but it's not change that's beyond our, our capacity in my view. And we will be very quickly getting up to speed here and starting to deliver in 2022, what will I hope be a, a really significant change. I think it will add significantly to Watford's branding, prestige, self-image, and otherwise. Why wouldn't we be the first to do this, is the question I'd ask myself. And I think the answer is simple enough uh, in many respects. So we'd welcome all your assistance. We're very happy to debate and consult on this. It's a really significant uh, program and change that we're about to bring upon ourselves, if you want to put it in those terms. So we do need everybody's assistance and we really, really will appreciate over the coming months input into this overall process. So Ken, if that's okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Michael. And uh, I think it's on behalf of all of us, it's great to see the leading role the council are taking, leading with gusto, as you said there early on. So uh, I think we will, we will harvest that energy and go forward from today's event. But I think the rest of the speakers will contribute also to how else we can all help you and, and the city move on. And I'm going to move on to our next speaker, Grace O'Sullivan, Member of European Parliament since July 2019, I think, Grace. And I think um, you're broadcasting live from Timor this morning, and hopefully all as well. And we're delighted that you've been able to join us. So over to you, Grace. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Ken. And it's great to be coming to you from Timor. And... Um, I'm going to focus very much on the, the decarbonising of Waterford. And I'd like to start just by thanking Jared Hurley 
and Linda Lawton and all at uh, Waterford Chamber for inviting me to this, what I consider a really important uh, webinar today. And I'd also um, uh, like to thank Michael Welsh uh, for his opening uh, presentation. And as usual, like Michael is, it takes that very um, pragmatic approach and, um, I, and is so experienced. And Michael, you might say you're not a, an expert, but by God, you've certainly built up some expertise in your role uh, over the many, many years in uh, and leading Waterford Council. Um, so I think we're, uh, we've a good man at the helm there. Um, and, uh, and it is ambitious. There's no doubt about it, but at least it's on the agenda and we're on the move. And we have to do that. Just looking back at the IPCC report um, uh, that came out over the summer, uh, raising the red flag for humanity if we don't take action. So when Waterford and County and City signed the, the EU Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, they joined actually a network of thousands of local governments um, voluntarily committed to achieving and exceeding the EU climate and energy targets. So that's ambitious and, and it's good. And we're part of a, a big group now. And um, I mean, I understand that we it's not something that can be undertaken by just one person or one entity or indeed local, uh, national or on a European uh, level. Uh, political leadership, it needs uh, an all hands on deck approach. There's no doubt about it uh, from top to bottom and left to right. So we need definitely a huge collaborative approach in order um, to achieve this, uh, um, uh, this uh, goal or this uh, ambition. So making Waterford a carbon neutral city is about uh, changing the heartbeat of the city for me and transit, that we transition towards a, a new and a healthy ways of living in a more sustainable way and that are not only good for city, city dwellers uh, and all the rest, but it's good for the environment and it's good for our image, it's good for us internationally and I think it, it's a really good for Brand Waterford. Um, as uh, many of you know, I am a, a member of the European Parliament and most of my work over the last uh, two years has been around the Environment Action Programme to 2030. And this is a really far uh, reaching piece of uh, environmental legislation. And I'm the Parliament's lead negotiator on this. Um, and I, I'm just at this moment, we're actually uh, in trilogues with the European, I mean, trilogues with the European Commission and the European Council um, to try to get them to support um, some of the uh, positive um, language I've put into the uh, Environment Action Programme. So I needn't tell you this is, uh, it's tough going um, uh, when you're uh, in these trilogues, in these negotiations. And even during the summer now, I had massive um, success with my own colleagues in the European Parliament uh, because I managed to get overwhelming support uh, for my report. Uh, and that was a, a good step. And the reason I mentioned in that is that, you know, hard slogs pay off, hard work pays off. That's my experience. Um, and uh, I'm certainly looking at Waterford Council and looking at the Chamber and yourselves in WIT. Um, I mean, everyone's already, you know, uh, kind of excited about this. And uh, I think um, we're well up to it. So um, in Europe at the moment, it's all about the European Green Deal. So that was the um, massive strategy that the president, Ursula von der Leyen, announced uh, when she took up her position. And essentially, every strategy is moving in the direction of the vision of the European Green De Deal. So uh, everything is moving towards carbon neutrality by 2050. And 2030 is a really important road uh, uh, map because that's a, a date like that's a first major target date that we're working towards um, in order to get all environmental legislation pushing towards the, the uh, climate uh, neutrality. So there's no easy or quick way to transit the planet to a more sustainable future, but actually our lives depend on it. So throughout the world and throughout Waterford decarbonizing it, it's becoming a part of everyone's uh, way of life. and. Um, and only yesterday I had, uh, and I was delighted to speak at a brilliant uh, new initiative for, at Waterford Port, and that's where 
in conjunction with Irish Rail and XPO Logistics, a new uh, rail freight service was launched. And that service is now bringing goods by rail from Waterford to Ballina. And it's, um, it, it's a move that will see many heavy goods vehicles off the road. Uh, it'll save not only on fuel costs, but also on greenhouse gas emissions. So this kind of uh, positive example uh, is already putting us on the road towards carbon neutrality. So this, I believe, a can-do attitude goes a long way. And the message is simple. We can tackle climate change if we seriously tackle greenhouse gas emissions. So the overarching objective of the, the European Green Deal is for the EU to become the first climate neutral con continent, resulting in cleaner environment, more affordable energy, smarter transport, new jobs, and better way of life. Um, and it's fundamental that action happens, everyone on, on this and Waterford leading. But Waterford's not the only one uh, on, the uh, on this quest. So throughout, uh, Europe, and this is really what I want to focus on, is we have exa uh, excellent examples of initiatives in and around cities where transition towards carbon neutrality is already underway. So, for instance, in Valencia, or Valencia, as they say, um, in Spain, it's uh, becoming the first fully integrated smart city. So their sustainable uh, urban mobi mobility plan promotes sustainable urban mo mobility throughout the city. Um, in uh, um, Copenhagen, they have a new trolleybus fleet providing emissions-free transport. In Copenhagen, they also have an initiative helping SMEs develop green business plans um, with advice on how to save energy and uh, use resources more efficiently. Measure what, uh, that, um, what they're <coughs> expected to achieve by greenhouse, uh, reducing greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Uh, and it's very significant. And in Louvre, in um, a city in, near close to Brussels, uh, extra financial resources in the form of a subsidy of 1.5 million euros from the EIB, European Investment Bank, was used for climate adaptation uh, actions and including renovation of more than 100 buildings. So um, they've also uh, pushed in on the whole cycling highway from Louvre to Brussels uh, to reduce congest congestion and pollution. Um, so in Athens, authorities are working with the knowledge that the efficiency of electric vehicles in terms of energy consumption, it relies heavily on the user's driving style. So what they're doing to tackle that is they're, they're introducing, or they've introduced a, an eco driving training for electric bus drivers, um, where they learn uh, to drive in ways that reduce fuel and energy consumption, and of course, cut greenhouse gases. So there's a number of funding mechanisms to, in place to facilitate the European Green Deal investment that will fund the delivery of the policy uh, needed to, for the reform. Um, and uh, that funding is available and has been put to good use by these cities already. So um, where decarbonizing action plans are, are in place, the cohesion policy um, is the EU's main investment um, uh, to, uh, mechanism. Um, so, you know, that's something we in Watford uh, can start to look into, and Michael talked about that, the investment. And then the ERDF, the European Regional Development Funds, there's 15 billion set aside for urban development strategies. Um, Horizon 2020 is the big one. That's the huge fund um, that uh, is being used in many, in some cities. There's uh, an initiative called the Jive Initiative, which promotes the deployment of fuel cell buses. So we'll all be jiving. And there's a, a, a elliptic, another project on the electrification of public transport, uh, which is already involving uh, European cities. So Watford re really benefit from these. And I think, um, um, you know, uh, we need to source that funding. Um, and I certainly am here um, at the disposal of the council to, to support in that regard. And so uh, I also want to um, once again shout out, give a shout out to Gerald Hurley because he really did uh, take some initiative a few years ago to uh, collaborate with Michael and the council and with WIT and fair use to Gerald and I hope you continue to with enthusiasm to drive it forward. 
but it's all about buy-in around enterprise and innovation. It's about transport, it's about clean energy, it's about comfortable living, everything that Michael said, the consumption, uh, the whole lot. But for me, it's about thinking outside the box and also looking at what we have and what we can do better. So, I, and I agree with Michael in terms of the low hanging fruit, get the momentum going. So, um, uh, it, and look, altogether, I believe it will give us a better city. In Watford, we have significant infrastructure and di digital access. Uh, we've over 600,000 skilled workers within 60 minutes of the city. So I think the decarbonisation, um, you know, we have it with the investors and with the skilled workers and uh, with the community. Um, I think we can uh, do this. So for me, uh, and going back to how Michael finished, uh, making Watford Ireland's first decarbonised city is about saying to the world that when the Irish Times announced last week that the first prize for the best place to live in Ireland was awarded to Watford, they're absolutely right. Of course, we're lucky folk didn't we know that, okay, we know that already. But Waterford is Ireland's oldest city, Ireland's first city. So now let's get on board and create another first for our fabulous city and make it the first decarbonized city in Ireland. And uh, I am very excited about that prospect. And as I said, I'm there full square behind anyone who's moving along this pathway and uh, join and support them. So Ken, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone uh, in Toys for Us and uh, WIT for uh, uh, organizing the, the whole thing. Thank you. That's great. Uh, thanks, Grace. And thanks for your enthusiasm and obviously your energy and, and all the ideas. I think it's clear we have uh, many lessons we can learn from sister cities in Europe and through your role and knowledge, we, we definitely lean on that because that we can take shortcuts in some cases and that low hanging fruit conversation that maybe we can quite quickly learn from others and adapt here where appropriate. Um, Water is a great history and great trading links with the world. So we should use those links and those partnerships across Europe in particular, uh, where appropriate, obviously. So thank you for all of that. And obviously the funding, your opportunities you mentioned, Grace, and the EU deal, we need to get a bit more knowledge about all of that and, and get, get serious about that. But I think that's part of Michael's plan as well, I'm sure, as he puts together the, the wider team. So thank you for all of that. I should say, by the way, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If anybody wants to ask a question of Grace or Michael, or indeed our, our next couple of speakers, please enter the questions in the Q&A box and we'll, we'll get to them in about uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes time. Um, so thank you for that, Grace. I'm gonna move on now to Owen Power, our next speaker. Owen is the director of Enerpower based in Waterford and his company works on projects across the country. Um, he's very active in the Waterford Chamber and as Huge experience in relation to sustainable energy solutions. So over to you, Owen. Thank you, Ken. I'm just going to share my screen here now. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. Ken, you can see it, yeah? Sorry, Owen. Yes, I can see it. Thank you. Okay, good. And you can hear me. That's perfect. Okay. So this is Ener Enerpower, Complete Energy Solutions for Your Business. Um, we're involved in solar, wind, biomass, fuel supply, and heat pumps. Um, we're established in 2005 to meet the needs of businesses who want to move to renewable energy. Um, we bring low carbon solutions to our clients, and we make renewable energy accessible and affordable for all businesses, or we try to anyway. Uh, we're involved in these sectors, um, retail, healthcare, basically every sector, every business sector in Ireland, we have done some projects in them. Um, some of our projects in Ireland just give you an idea of where they are around the country, be there solar, biomass, wind, or heat pumps. Or, um, some of our customers there, I'm sure there's names you can recognize. Um, we have Flavins there in County Watford and Arkeen Stores would be another one and Grantstown Nurseries here in Watford that we've worked with. Um, what have we done in 2020? Uh, we've saved um, 8.2 million kilowatt hours of energy that would have come from fossil fuels came from renewable energy, um, which is equivalent of meeting 2000 homes requirements for energy over the year and we reduced the carbon output by 200 and 2,687 tons. Um, so we're, what do we do? We're um, 
experts in renewable energy um, in the project development, implementation and operation of that. Um, so we start off at the feasibility stage, uh, we come into a potential client and we can offer feasibility as to what type of project would mean the best or get the best benefit for the client. Um, when we decide on that, then we go to um, the design of the project, planning permission, grant applications if they're required, and then the supply and installation of the equipment and then the operation of the equipment and the after sales service, including maintenance and that. And we also provide ESCO contracts or power purchase agreements for renewable energy contracts. And this is where the client has zero upfront capital to put into the project. We take the upfront capital and the client pays back over a set period, contracted period of time for the energy that they actually use. Um, say in terms of renewable energy heating projects, um, Heat pumps are one technology that, that we use. They're extremely efficient uh, machines. So to give you an example, if you buy one kilowatt hour of electricity, you'll get three kilowatt hours of heat back. And that's something that's, especially now with the where the price of gas and oil has gone, this is something now that can provide real value for people and as well as helping the environment. Um, heat pumps, there's no combustion in a heat pump. They require less maintenance. They can also provide cooling in certain situations. And they have very long lifespans, up to 50 years, and they attract SEI and the Accelerated Capital Allowance grants. And then some places that we have them, Bulmers, Banner, Tricell and Clarny, we operate some of our solutions. Um, this is another heating project we are involved in. This is, this is a very interesting project from our point of view. It's the South Dublin District Heating Scheme. And the idea of the scheme basically is to take excess heat from a data center here at the top of the screen and put that down through a district heating pipe network to Tala Institute of Technology and to the South Dublin County uh, Hall building. And the blue lines there are proposed extensions to that initiative. So this is something that is actually, we're actually on site there at the moment, and most of this, the red line pipes are in place, and we're now looking at building this heating center here to transfer the energy out of the data center and into the pipes and distribute it then throughout the network. So it's um, 3,000 meters of pipe um, over, is what will take the pipe or the project to be completed. Um, to give you just the, the basic principles of this idea. So the data center has heat out there at around 25 degrees. It needs to get rid of 25 degree heat. We take that heat and we put it into our two stage heat pump and we can basically um, raise that heat to 75, 70 to 85 degrees which is the required temperature we need in the actual network. So that's the basic principle of it. And this principle could be mirrored across any of the data centers in the country. And I think data centers are getting a lot of uh, publicity at the moment for being huge users of electricity. And this is one way where data centers could actually contribute something back. If again, um, this, um, project is part of a public-private partnership with South Dublin County Council and that's the key to it is the public-private partnership here without the council's involvement in this this certainly wouldn't be possible um, and here's some pictures of the actual pipes now in the ground in Dublin at present this runs down the Belgard Road in Dublin um, so it's Ireland's first large-scale district heating and cooling network it's publicly owned by Dublin City Council um, or South Dublin Council, um, up to 1.5 million kilograms of CO2 emissions will be eliminated per year, um, and up to four megawatts of total energy output of the existing heat source, and enough heat available for more than 5,000 households. Initial connection to the education and government buildings and hopefully we'll be able to expand this, and obviously hoping to expand that model from, to different other data centers around the country, which we know there is quite a few of them and more in the planning. Um, another area we're involved in would be biomass boilers. 
which is using wood, uh, which is a carbon neutral resource. So this is um, a leisure centre in Thurles, which we, we work with Thurles County Council on that. And again, it's another public private partnership in conjunction with Thurles County Council and Power, where we went in, we put a boiler in and they pay basically for kilowatt hours of heat that they actually use. And they're saving money every year in doing that. Um, this is CJ Shearer, and it's a, one of the largest biomass boilers in the country. And this company actually has two of these boilers, one in their Mount Rat facility and one in their facility in Ballon Road in Galway. So again, huge. Um, this company was using oil for the process, and now they've moved completely over to wood. Um, again, a great initiative. This is a, a nurseries in um, County Wexford near New Ross. They produce tomatoes. And again, they made the move a couple of years ago over to Woodchip and never looked back. They're saving an awful lot of money and obviously helping the environment in doing that. Now we move on to some wind projects that we're involved in. Um, this is our Tesco distribution centre in Donabate in Dublin. And so one megawatt wind turbine in there. And that, that helps displace between 20 and 25% of the energy requirements of that building. So that's um, a significant proportion of the energy. Everyone can see this turbine is located in a car park. So it just shows you that turbines are not all for up in the mountains. They can actually go um, closer to buildings. And this one of the unique things about this is, I suppose, it's right beside the energy is generated exactly where it's needed. So there's no distribution losses. So everything that's generated here goes straight into the into that building. Um, Flavins here in County Waterford put up a wind turbine um, there a number of years ago. Very successful again, 20 to 25% of their renewable energy. And I'll come in a slide in a few minutes. We've also see Flavins there have installed solar panels as well in conjunction with wind. But I'll come to that slide in a separate slide. This is a larger project now in Keypack and Meat Factory in Watergrass Hill. Two megawatt wind turbine we installed. Again, it's going to generate about 4 million kilowatt hours per year on that site. And this site is unique in that we installed a 350,000 litre water tank with this, um, with, with this project, because at certain times in the day and during, the site, during their production cycle, they won't be able to use all the power generated by the wind turbine. So we installed this hot water tank to soak up that energy. So that water tank has five 200 kilowatt immersion heaters. So we can basically put one megawatt of power into that tank at any one time if we need to. And we can see the control. It's a complicated enough control mechani mechanism to control this tank. We need to mix the water to make sure that we have a homogeneous solution in the tank, that we have the same temperature all the way up through the tank, and we maximize the amount of energy that we can put into this tank. And we can see there, when this snapshot was taken, we had 73 degrees in the tank for 350,000 litres of water. So that was a significant amount of energy that otherwise wouldn't have been able to be used, but can go straight back into this tank. Um, Keypack are unique in that they actually have a, a requirement for a huge amount of water in their process. I think this is the only one of this type in the country that uses this type of technology to store energy like this. Um, now we move on to solar panels. Um, and we have a number of slides there on solar panels, typical case studies there. Um, we would do a design up like this and we have a couple of um, modeling softwares that we use. Um, and we use the half hour data that the site would use, how, much, how many kilowatt hours they're using on an hourly basis. And we would use that to size what size of solar system would be suitable for their particular si situation. And peaks in the actual output there, depending on when. Return rate of return would be and what the payment um, payback period is for the project. So each customer would need to see that before they can, or this information helps them to make a decision um, in that regard. Um, these are some other jobs that we've done around the country. Virgin Media, or one of their data centers in Dublin, have put solar panels on the roof. Again, this is um, Flavins, 
out in Kilmac Thomas here in Waterford. And John Flavin put up a wind turbine and then he went and put up solar panels. And solar and wind um, oppose each other. Generally, when we have wind, we don't have much um, sun. And when we have a lot of sun and good weather, we don't have much wind. So they do work um, nicely together and complement each other nicely. Um, our Keen Shopping Centre here in Waterford, another good initiative there, 120, 100, 100 kilowatts there of solar on the roof. The only thing you, you can't actually see it when you drive into the into the supermarket there, it's on the opposite side to the car park, but um, it's there all right. Um, this is Little, the project we worked on at Little, which was the largest rooftop solar when it was built at the time in their new distribution centre in Kildare. Um, then that was um, superseded by Sam Denigan, which put up a 1.5 megawatt system there. Sam Denigan is a, um, a fresh fruit and veg supplier, um, mainly into the Dunn Stores group. Um, now this is um, Eli Lilly. Um, this is now the largest um, solar installation in Southern Ireland. Um, it's a six megawatt system, ground mounted, 13,000 solar panels, 22 acres. And um, this is the start off of the project where we installed the piles into the ground um, to support the frames that take the solar panels. The machine that drives in the solar panels is, or drives in the piles, actually the pile driving machine, is on the left-hand side of the screen there. So that goes around 22 acres, driving in all these 8,000 piles need to be put into the ground. And this is what it looks like today. It's completed and generating 6 million kilowatt hours a year of electricity, and it's going straight into the Eli Lilly facility there in down in Kinsale. And again, we're generating electricity at the point of where it's used. Uh, another nice initiative. This is the maintenance team arriving on site. So we were able to get sheep to go into the 22 acres to help keep the grass down rather than using chemicals or anything like that. We decided we put sheep in there and it's a nice um, thing to be able to do to have the ground still producing grass and the sheep are helping us keep the, um, keep the grass down not getting up onto the panels. Um, by solar, um, obviously increasing energy costs. And I think everyone in business is aware at the moment that over the last couple of months, energy prices have really gone scarily high due to a number of different factors. Uh, but what solar can give you a 20% ROI. It also get a grant from SEAI of 30%, um, accelerated capital loan scheme, which comes from revenue of 12.5%. And solar works in Ireland and has been proven to work in Ireland. You can stabilize a certain proportion of your energy costs. You can reduce your carbon, meet your environmental targets. Every roof um, in Ireland basically can, nearly every roof, I'd say about 99% of them, can accommodate solar panels. It's a very low maintenance. It's a 12 year warranty on the solar panels themselves. And it's extremely reliable in that there's no moving parts in solar panels. It's just electricity moving around. Um, what are the first steps? I suppose um, the initial assessment to see where, where the site is, um, looking at the electricity invoices that a company would have and what their half hour electrical load data looks like, site visit, agree a design, submit the applications, uh, get planning permission and get your grant, and then um, installation and commissioning and operation. Um, just one other slide there, I suppose, is just giving you an idea of what the irradiance levels are like in Ireland. So solar works quite well here. There's no question about that. And we have, you know, even certain parts of the country down on the south coast work extremely well. A lot of light. Um, service and maintenance package and power are able to support everything that we install. So that's part of our commitment when we get involved with a client is um, we're there to see the project out to its end of life. Uh, we remotely monitor all these systems and we provide routine maintenance. And Enerpower now, we started in 2005, we now employ 31 people. We have 360 sustainable projects completed, um, 125 million kilowatt hours generated from renewable energy and 41 million kilowatt hours, or kilograms, excuse me, 
of CO2 saved over that period. So that's, um, that's what Enerpower are doing at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Owen. Uh, that's great. And uh, a lot of detail there, but it's some phenomenal numbers. I mean, it is, as an engineer, we like numbers anyway, but it does come down to numbers and making real progress against that carbon challenge. So, so thanks to you for that presentation today. And I go, I'm sure there'll be a few questions later on, Owen, for you as well, and indeed the others uh, in relation to, to some of those projects. Um, I'm particularly taken by the South Dublin Public Private Partnership uh, model, which is something that maybe Waterford can think about as well. So thanks for that. Um, so uh, as Michael and Grace indicated earlier, the scale and nature of what's required to decarbonize the city is very significant. But again, Enerpower and other specialists are key to helping making that happen, I suppose that's the key message. Our next speaker is also a specialist, and uh, no pressure Derek, but Derek Scully is the Head of Corporate Affairs at Energia. Uh, Energia are also sponsors of Toys for Engineers and Waterford Chamber, uh, actively contributing to the decarbonization challenges across the island uh, of Ireland, and have great knowledge and services to help Waterford on its journey. So over to you, Jerry. Thanks, Ken. Um, I think just on behalf of the group, we'll start with just saying how delighted we are to be sponsors uh, of this event. It's, it's certainly brilliant across the week. There's an amazing amount going on. And even for this session, that's was a special thanks to Linda and Gerald, as well as to the other panelists and the minister. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with the bad news, probably for people listening. I'm not an engineer, so <laughs> you're not going to get much. Uh, out of me uh, on that side uh, and also I don't have all the answers uh, and probably if I did uh, we may not be talking today it could be a very different conversation but it's the nature of this it, it, it's going to be really really uh, challenging but sort of the spirit of, of, of what I want to get to today I'll give you a really brief overview of who we are what I think the, the main challenge is and as a group that we're focused on um, and it's almost to, to start that conversation, make sure it gets into our daily narrative about what it is we're trying to achieve. I'm gonna give a couple of examples about where I think that has really worked well and the benefits of it for that Waterford in particular are gonna be able to draw from it. Uh, and then just maybe just touch on a little bit of uh, for business towards the end. So I just have a brief presentation. Um, hopefully we can, you can all see. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll just get started. Uh, give me a second. Now, um, so who are we? Uh, is probably a good place to start. And Energy uh, uh, Group is, is one of the leading energy companies on the island. Um, like dwelling on the investments we've made to date, what's really interesting, and, and certainly for us, uh, is, is this future challenge that we have to decarbonize. And we've put 3 billion towards this challenge to 2030. Uh, and that in itself has helped the group grow. Uh, certainly even in the last probably 18 months over COVID, we've grown the group over hundred people. We've also achieved a business working responsibly mark, which we're incredibly proud of and business in the community. The rest of the three pieces here are, well, that's, that's our group. There are three main business units. We have a flexible generation business, which is gas fired plant, we have a customer solutions business and we have a renewables business. Now, Michael, that's, that's all fine. That's not really all that interesting. And well, at least at the very least anyway, when the wind isn't blowing, then you're gonna have gas fire generation to back that up and continue to supply customers. Well, that's all true, right? And there's over 820,000 customers that we do supply. What is really interesting to us is how all of this starts to work together. So we think traditionally about electricity systems, you generate it at one end, you send it through the wires, the customer uses it whenever they want it at the other end. That's not how we see a modern utility operating. And what we're keen to do in the next phase here is maximize the value, not just in the network, because for those who may not be aware, the network only uses, uh, it, it's sort of average load is only about 20%. So if we can up that, if when the wind is blowing strong and, and we otherwise don't have demand for it, if we can store it or incentivize customers to use it at those times or incentivize customers to have technology that enables them to use it. We have a 24 seven trading team who are able to optimize across these sort of horizons. And it's the new technology that's coming along with smart meters that makes this really, really interesting. I think our view, and we did work with UCC and Mara over the last while is that gas is gonna be required, right? But the objective here is to use less of it and replace that with renewable technology. So we have 15 wind farms across the country uh, as it is. Uh, we also 
have long-term contracts to bring over a quarter of all wind power to the market. Um, we're also investing in battery storage, which is a neat solution. I'm going to come back to green hydrogen in a little bit uh, with one of the examples I have later on. But we have a pipeline of over three gigawatts, and this is over 500 megawatts of solar, equivalent in onshore wind, two very significant offshore wind projects. And one of those is located off the coast of Waterford, and the public consultation on that is open at the moment. So if anybody wants to learn a little bit more, it's at a very early stage, uh, but that's at northcelticseawind.ie. Now, that's us. What is the challenge, right? So what, what's the policy landscape? And this changes all the time. So back in 2017, we did a bit of work with uh, PwC and we looked at what's the overall emissions profile of Ireland and what does it need to get to in 2050? And that's the graph, if you like, on the left-hand side. And what you can see is we, we largely left agriculture alone and we looked at all of the other sectors and said, right, what needs to happen here? You can see every sector with the exception of agriculture drops down to one, one and a half uh, million tonnes of CO2, which is a really significant drop. And again, one of the things to draw out of this slide, which probably wasn't apparent to people at the, at the very beginning when we were doing the study, electricity generation, yes, a lot of emissions. Agriculture, yes, a lot of emissions. But the residential and transport sectors are the ones that have been following after that as well as industrial heating and, and processing. So there's a lot of opportunity here, uh, but they're the areas that we, we really need to focus on. So we can see this is what we have to do for, for 2050 by and large. Then in 2019, we had the Climate Action Plan. Uh, Richard Breton brought this proposal forward, uh, which looked at the changes required to 2030. This program with an awful lot of milestones and, 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 and targets set out in it, but it included 500,000 homes nationally to a BT standard to be retrofitted. Currently in Waterford City, about 9% of houses are at that standard. So it gives you an indication of just how far we have to go. There's also a million EVs in that plan to get to 2030. And down below, there's the EPA's own analysis of what this means. The orange line is, well, if not an awful lot, uh, changes between now and 2030. The blue line is if we implement the measures, the additional measures that are in the Climate Action Plan. So you can see we go from about 60 million tonnes down to target in the Climate Action Plan was in the range of 35 million tonnes. Following on, more policy, then we programme for government came out, the programme really ambitious, put the green recovery at the core of our economic recovery from COVID. Really, really important statement and a lot of commitments in there, which we get to uh, in a minute. Then, as Grace has already mentioned, we have the IPCC report, right? First time scientifically stated, you know what, guys, it's partly our fault. So the good news in that is that if we caused it, we can fix it. And I think the other really strong message out of this is that if we don't act urgently and we don't take really radical steps in the next 12 years, we will have already run out of the road that we have. We will have a one and a half to two percent change in climate in just 12 years. Whereas in fact, that's the object, the overall objective uh, of, of COP26 coming up and, and obviously the Paris Agreement uh, out, out to 2050. So really urgent action required. Then we had our own report, uh, the Met Aaron did a report along with the Marine Institute and EPA. And if anybody was in any doubt, 15 of the last 20, of the 20 warmest years on record are since 1990. We've had 6% more rain on average since 1990. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions are up. We've, particularly perhaps relevant to Waterford, since 1990, there's been a six to nine centimeter increase in sea level. Right? This, this is alarming, really, really alarming. Um, and overall, we have a temperature increase in the last 120 years of about uh, a degree. Right, so it's clear a whole load of things need to change here. And back at, at the sea level, not only have we seen a rise, but we've seen an increase in acidity, but also in surface temperature. So lots of problems, right? So part of the good news is the technology exists to, to fix them. The policy, as Grace has already said, then came from the EU and Green Deal, a 55% emission reduction um, relative to 1990 to 2030, along with a whole load of measures 
new energy efficiency, new renewable packages, financing, whole load of change. And then most recently, uh, we've had uh, the Minister bring forward the Climate Action Low Carbon Development Act. Hugely significant piece of legislation in Ireland, going to drop emissions relative to 2018, not like the EU study, or the 5055, not relative to 1990, but relative to 2018, we now have to have a 7% annual reduction or in effect halve our emissions to 2030. We're not gonna change these slides too much, but now the green line shows you, we need to get to 30 million tonnes in 10 years. The measures, the million EVs, the 500,000 homes we retrofitted to a B2 level, gave us 3.5% of a reduction per annum. It was based on, on, on that to provide 25% overall savings 2030. We're now on a trajectory to do 7% per annum and achieve the same halving of our emissions uh, in just that short space of time. So, huge challenge. Why then, what does this in effect mean for business? Well, you can, we can all look at this and go, oh, that means we're gonna have to do X, Y, and Z, but I actually don't have, I'm not gonna, don't really have the money available. We're coming through a really bad time. And this is the same for households as well. But I think that's possibly the wrong way to look at it. The way to look at it is, Everything's going to change anyway. Okay, so if I go back to, uh, and Owen's already mentioned it, customers and consumers are changing their attitudes to what they want to buy. They're looking at labels. They want to see sustainability at the core of businesses and how they operate. But central to all of this is that banks are starting to do it. And it's no coincidence, obviously, Commissioner McGuinness is, is in this role now. But if you want to get a mortgage in the future, you'll have more favorable rates if it's green. If you're home, if you want to get money in to operate in the future to make an investment to the business, it'll be cheaper if it's green. If you want to go out and sell a business, there'll be a premium because you're green. So there's a whole load of carrot and stick out there. And I think what's important maybe just to draw, draw from it, we don't want to focus on the cost. Right? The, the cost to me is the wrong metric. It's the investment. And the difference is the investment brings about a change and you avoid a whole load of other costs that you otherwise would have had to pay for being a non-climate compliant company. So investment becomes critical way to look at this. So don't look at the huge amount that you have to put in. In fact, the companies Owens worked with and the companies we worked with are really good examples of this. They've looked at it and gone, actually, what's the proposition here? What's my return if I do this relative to if I don't do it, as opposed to just how much is it gonna cost me? I've picked two port country uh, areas, and I'm gonna, I'll be quick on these, um, partly because I have some experience of both of them. Uh, back in uh, 1999, I had a fortune of living in Bergen in Norway for a year. Uh, this, I think if, if we're gonna put it in some sort of context, was still about 10 years before any of us had an iPhone. And so if we wanna know the pace at which things can change, there's a really good uh, example. But at the time, the city in Bergen had congestion charging, right? You, you, to drive into the city, you needed to pay. Uh, it had already about 80% of its electricity, of its heating demand came from electricity. Now, today, about 90% of the new cars bought in Norway are electric vehicles or hybrids. Only 10% of what are being bought with new cars are ICs or internal combustion engines. About 90% of their heating is coming from electricity. Part of this is because they have quite extreme seasons and they need to have really well insulated homes, but it shows there's a lead in time for all of this. And in many ways, if we start thinking and talking about the small measures that we can see around us, it makes us more open to accelerate that change and take further steps into the future. So I think really, really important. And on top of all of that, through their use of renewables, they have much lower electricity prices. So, Bergen's a really good example about if you place where we've been doing it for a long time, it can really, really speed up as you as, uh, as new technology comes to the fore, people are just more willing to adopt. In Belfast, we have our own experience in Belfast around hydrogen. So a number of years ago, we started talking to Transwing about hydrogen buses in the city. There's now hydrogen buses going around the city. We're just at the final end of commissioning a hydrogen refueling station. And green hydrogen is going to come from our long range wind farm to power those buses, right? That's a really good story in itself. However, 
by having hydrogen in the city and having people talk about it, it gave rise to the Belfast Mar Maritime Consortium. We're part of this by providing hydrogen to the Artemis uh, led group, which is looking at hydrogen and electric ferries and marine maritime transport to and from, so from Bangor into Belfast and other initiatives. And that drew in the universities that got people really looking at this around the port where hydrogen is going to play a huge part in maritime transport in the future. It'll also have spin-offs, no doubt, um, as a store of energy and, and other uses. So really exciting. It doesn't stop there. We've recently just been given a further round of funding from Innovate UK and the Green Seas Initiative in Belfast, which again builds on that base of hydrogen interest and the companies that are starting to set up in and around Belfast, the university courses that are targeted towards it, where there's a real buzz, there's that opportunity, sort of the point Michael spoke about and the opportunity the minister mentioned, it's, it's not the big plan, it's when we start to roll that out and when we start to have really tangible benefits arising from it, it snowballs from there and it can really drive significant change. So if I just finish with, with, with business and sort of the, perhaps some odd graphics that I've just in, in, included here, I think my advice at this stage, as well as all of the brilliant things that people might invest in right now, my starting point for all businesses is understand your baseline. Know what you are emitting today. Know where your large uh, right, sources of carbon are coming from. And also understand, use that to understand the risks. Every business has a business plan. Every business should have a climate plan. You should understand how the changes that are coming, your business is going to face risks, but also be provided with opportunities. From there, you can go talk to other people. Networks are so, so important. And I think this is where the huge opportunity in Waterford is. People get together in clusters to understand the challenges and the solutions. And I think you'd be amazed at just how quickly you can start to unlock some of that, including finance. And this goes back to this point that capital is looking for green homes. Being able to accelerate that, being able to build on Waterford is a brilliant place to live. Right. It, it, it's sort of win-win for everybody, but it means working together. And that's where this narrative is so important. And this is where, in terms of the things we can all change in our own life, well, we can do the biggest change I'd like to see as well as retrofitting homes and looking at food waste and buying EVs or using more public transport, is let's start talking about this transition. Let's start talking about what it means. Let's start talking about how we can take advantage of it. And that in itself, I think going back to Bergen and looking at Belfast as examples, to me is where you can really start to drive real change and there's real dividend for local communities and areas where that can happen. So that's, that's a quick tour. Hopefully I'm not over it by much, but I look forward to your questions in the Q&A. Thanks, Derek. That's great. And again, uh, I think the policy landscape was very interesting. But yeah, the examples of Bergen and Belfast are very well made. And I think we can learn a lot of lessons from, from those cities in Waterford. A lot of connection between Belfast and Waterford in terms of history, in terms of shipbuilding and Port City and all of that. So the hydrogen example was really interesting. I was very curious to hear about that myself. Um, at this stage, I think, Derek, you referred to how do we make the first steps and you don't have all the answers. Uh, I'm going to introduce two people. I'm going to start with, um, with Kathleen, Kathleen O'Regan, who's Senior Environmental Officer with uh, Enterprise Ireland and is... I think Enterprise Ireland are, are one of our great agencies and they're helping a lot of Irish indigenous companies on all sort, in all sorts of ways, but certainly on their green journey. I might just very quickly ask Kathleen to make a comment or even just to outline what Enterprise Ireland might be able to do in terms of funding. Thanks, Ken, and thanks for the invite to talk today. And um, look, just some really interesting presentations there from everyone. And I suppose highlighting the challenges there, you know, to business, but also the opportunities that are there as well. So Enterprise Ireland launched the Climate Enterprise Action Fund earlier this year, which are a number of supports for Enterprise Ireland and Uderos clients. So there's a climate action voucher, a green start and a green plus. And there's also supports for local enterprise office clients. There's green from WICO and a, and a green start will soon be available. And these are supports to help companies get external expertise in to help build the capabilities within the company. So um, as Derek mentioned there, the first step for a lot of companies is to understand where they are now, to understand their baseline and to help put that plan in place. So there's different levels of support to help companies 
depending on what part of the journey that they're on, whether they're starting out in their journey or if they're already on their green journey to accelerate next steps. So I suppose look for more information on the supports, you can go to globalambition.ie forward slash climate action. So that's for the Enterprise Ireland and Uderos supports. Or for the local enterprise office supports, go to local, localenterprise.ie forward slash green. Um, so yeah, if, I've, if there's any questions there, I'd be happy to, to, to help. But just to know, I suppose, look, that there is external expertise and there's grant support there to help companies on this journey and to avail of the opportunities um, that are there in transforming um, for what is the, I suppose, the low carbon resource efficient eco economy of, of the future. And it's great to see what, what Waterford are doing in, in this space. Thanks, Kathleen. That's great. Yeah, no, I've looked at the website. There's a lot on that website, actually. And if people can go there, I'm sure they get lots of information and contact you and colleagues if they need to afterwards. So thank you for that. I might invite Mark Akahasik, our TD from Waterford, to say a couple of words. Mark, obviously, from a national level, uh, you know, your strong interest, obviously, for obvious reasons in this area, but even in Waterford, how we, how we go on those first steps to get to 2040. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts at this stage. Yeah, thanks very much. I had a wry smile when Derek was talking about the changing policy landscape, because we might have had something to do with that. But I think actually Derek laid it out extremely well, my thinking on it as well, is that, that one way or another change is coming. And I think a successful business and a successful society and a successful city, as we're, we're seeing with the decarbonizing Waterford agenda, will try and get ahead of that change and try and make it work for their, their businesses, their societies, their cities. Um, I think this is really ambitious, what, what the Chamber and WIT and the Council have put in front of us. Uh, as, to echo some of Grace's comments, you know, we are the best place to live in, in Ireland. We are the first city and, and we're leading on this and it's absolutely appropriate. And I think we're a perfect fit. I think Eamon at the start uh, averted to the fact that we're the right size for this. We're the Goldilocks city. We're, we're not too big. We're not too small. We can do things like sustainable transport, which is one of the obvious insertion points for decarbonizing. We can do that well because we are a 15 minute city. If you are at the outer ring road, you can be at Reginald's Tower on a bicycle in 15 minutes, no problem. Or on other sustainable transport modes, if we get our public transport, for, for instance, humming along. Um, own kind of adverted to the fact that we have fantastic sustainable energy resources and particularly solar. Um, which we can really turn our hand to also wind resources off of our coast. So there's really, really exciting opportunities. Um, I've been looking some, at some of the research around sustainable transport and uh, cycling in particular. So it, I would have started my political journey with Waterford Cycling Campaign, for example. And there's huge research <clears throat> around the benefits for retail business in particular. So uh, people who are, arrive into your city by bike are more likely to get off their bike and wander into your retail business. But there's also a huge um, impact in terms of um, the well-being of workers. So it's known that people who commute to work by bike, and this it's Dutch figures would follow through on this, they, they're likely to miss fewer days at work and be more productive while they're at work. Now, what employer doesn't want that for their workers? So there, there's huge benefits here. There's huge op a huge challenge. I mean, I, we could... Uh, we could lie to ourselves and, and, and cast this in a positive light. There's a huge challenge in front of us, but I think Waterford is going about it in the correct way in choosing to meet the challenge head on and to kind of set out the ways that we can really positively influence and, and move forward with the challenge. Somebody coming into my office there in the background, but the, that's the joys of Zoom. It wasn't a child at least, which is the usual thing we see on the telly. <laughs> Mark, thanks for that. No, that's great. And uh, we're well used to all, it's all sorts of interruptions over the last 18 months uh, in our background. So thank you. Uh, I might just come, we, we had a couple of questions that I think Owen dealt with directly. So thanks Owen for those about uh, his particular company. I might just ask, go back to Michael. I know Michael's under pressure to go to another meeting. Michael, you, obviously you're working on the roadmap. We all want to help. What's the next steps or how, how do we help get this roadmap to a, a final version? And what's the timeline for that? Um, the timeline is the next two or three months. Um, um, my starting point, our start, collective starting point as council are going to consider this. Um, we have a session next week where we'll be discussing it with the elected council. Uh, we'll be going to public consultation reasonably immediately thereafter. Uh, and really, we're just looking for input. Like I say, we're not, there's nothing cut cast in stone in any respect here. 
in fact, I think it's very important that we view it as never being cast in stone because the reality is we're going to learn as we go here. We don't know everything. That's that's for certain, if you know what I mean. And this is going to be have to be adapted based on experience as we go along. The key issue from my point of view is from the start next year to get resources in place, get all the stakeholders involved, engaged. That's one of the reasons we'd be talking here. And we will be taking certain actions. I was very interested there to hear Derek, for example, saying, you know, the first thing for a business to do is look at their baseline. We're going to actually communicate and create templates and seek to provide simple training methods and otherwise for people to do some of that so that we kill some of the, the explanation and, uh, uh, and help in the learning path to that. Some of it is not that complex. And if we can start with the simple stuff, that's just the awareness. What am I using? How am I doing it? Could I do it a little bit differently? There's elements that you'll get a return on if you do it differently immediately. Let's start with that low-hanging fruit, if you know what I mean. But you can expect, I would think, that if we can put this together, that every single business in Waterford will be communicated with uh, uh, next year with a view to establishing those baselines. And ultimately, we want to collect that data as well, because all of this needs to be data and research-based and evidence-based in terms of uh, how we do it. Uh, so that'll be part of our challenge is build that baseline, not just for the individual entities, but for the, um, the, the collected entity that is Waterford City. That's great, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I think it's nobody has all the answers again, but I, I think uh, lots of positive enthusiasm here from everybody involved, and uh, it's it's great to see that. Uh, I think obviously it's also a moving target. Uh, I, I read Project 2040 on a regular basis, Michael. I look at the 85,000 people in Waterford by 2040, 19 years away. So even the size of the city and the nature of the city will change and evolve over the next 19 years. So you're right, the roadmap has got to be flexible enough to cope with that development also. It's not just a static city by any means, you know. So. So thanks for that. Uh, and just there's a question in here from Susan. Susan Gallagher, uh, works with a colleague here at WIT, about the whole impact on education and graduates. And obviously, from an engineering point of view, we're very well aware of technology and the engineering role. But really, this cuts across probably every, every graduate that is coming from WIT and the new university. So I might just ask uh, Grace very quickly. I know, Grace, you're under pressure as well. Do you have any thoughts on graduate attributes or skills of graduates coming from the new universities in relation to this green agenda? Um, look, uh, I mean, graduates are going to play a huge part in this. I think Mark mentioned that the, the whole RNI research and innovation, um, it, the, there's going to be huge um, support uh, funding. Um, and I talked about earlier the Horizon Fund of 95.5 billion that's um, available across Europe. But there's a new initiative that's um, just coming on screen now, the Smart Cities Mission, it's called. And it's kind of a, um, a race for um, cities, 100 cities in Europe to become um, uh, carbon neutral and that. So I think that's something we can pull in on. But I think that the role of uh, the, the graduates and the role of WIT and CIT and all of the learning institutes from bottom down to top up um, have, uh, have some, uh, really have something that they contribute. And I think now, um, I, like it, it, you know, the fact decarbonizing Waterford is on the agenda, climate change is on the agenda. So a few years ago, the challenge was that people weren't uh, waking up, weren't aware to the uh, ecological crisis we're in. So I think now that that, that is uh, generally accepted uh, from an, uh, an educational institutional point of view, um, that there's great opportunity. And also from an apprentice point of view, getting the apprentices um, uh, ready for the, the new jobs, the new market. Um, and um, I think that's also uh, going to be very important. But I mean, WIT, I think, has just, um, and, and to so, such a massive opportunity and a role here to um, develop in so many areas. Even Michael uh, talked about the behavior change we need. Like that sociological um, uh, uh, aspect is critically important. Then you come to your engineers with the offshore development, onshore development, floating rigs. All of this, you know, all this is going to be rolled out. And the European, um, the EIB, the investment bank, that's where the money is going to come in. If we 
And if you and if all together we can show that what we're doing is pushing along that pathway to carbon neutrality, I believe then the funding streams and the investment uh, will come in behind it. And I have to say, you know, I know the change is sometimes it, it, there's a fear in change. But there's also an excitement and a potential. And I think that's something um, that we can uh, definitely build on in Waterford, being the best living uh, city to live in in uh, Ireland. So I think we're good at some of these things. Thanks, Grace. And yeah, obviously, going into the big change for us is going into the new university and to take all of this, these ideas into all the faculties. Uh, we have a broad set of disciplines in our own school here, architecture, built environment, engineering, but also health sciences, science, business, education. So we have, a, we have a big job to do with a higher education and further education. But I also see there's a question in from John McSweeney about second level schools as well. And I also see two hands in the air. So I'm gonna to go to Mark first and then to Derek. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much. And actually it, it fits with the question in, in the Q&A. And I serve on the Joint Oireachtas Committee for Education, uh, as well as some of my other duties. And Leaving Cert reform is one of the things that we're discussing over the next extended period. And um, somebody said something that at the committee yesterday, which I found very difficult to get my head around. He said, the people who are sitting in leaving certs today may be in the workforce in 2070. Now to try and anticipate the level and scale of change that is going to happen in our economy and society in those intervening years, it's extremely difficult to do. Um, so I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to move away from content delivery because content will very soon be outdated. We have to move towards critical thinking skills. I think WIT has been one of the, the, the real strengths of the institution has been its flexibility and adaptability, and it's, a, its ability to move into new areas and new courses. Ken, you listed a whole, uh, a whole range of new courses. You neglected to mention your forestry degree, which is doing extremely well and is going to be so, so important or the fact that there's going to be an organic agriculture master's, which will be the first of its kind um, in the country, I believe. So WIT is very much moving into that space. And something else which I think is very, very imp important and very interesting is that idea of micro, micro accreditation. So maybe not your level eight, your level nine or whatever, but adaptive courses to take skills that you already have and to repurpose them to a new economy in some way or another and and just as suppose as a, a focal scar a kind of a parting word on it um as some of you may know the my colleague here brian Ledden, who is the chair of the joint rocks committee on climate action he's an engineer by background and i said to him flippantly last night um we need the engineers to change the world to save the world and he said yeah again uh, which I thought was very interesting, but it's true. When push comes to shove, and certainly in this case, we do need the engineers to come and save the world. That's knowing your audience and speaking to your audience right there, I think. Yeah, well, thanks for that. And uh, making a better world is obviously behind my shoulder here and it's very much conscious a part of everything we do here. So we're trying to bring that ethos forward. So thanks for that. Uh, and Derek, I know you want to say something and I'll come to a final question then. Over to you, Derek. Thanks, Ken. Look, it, it's really just quick and sort of builds on what Mark said. Whatever about 2070, if we're looking at the business today, and we're obviously focused a lot on 2030, the graduates we're going to be taking in in 2030 are starting their second cycle this, in school now, right? If we want the right skills to be there, we need to start bringing in an education around the climate and what we're trying to achieve at that early stage to get people interested. Because when we get to university, it's all, that, it's all too easy. I mean, I think there's been huge strides forward but for me, if I'm looking at what we need in 2030, we're going to meet, need people that are really, really clever with data because data is going to drive our entire economy, how we use things in a smart way. We, in furtherance of that, you need people to start looking at systems as opposed to looking at an electric, electrical engineer looking at one particular area, mechanical engineer looking at another. Actually, we need to start bringing all of that together. We need to really, and chemical engineers, obviously, with hydrogen and everything else that's coming in, we need to really start to understand full systems and how we can maximize the use of them. And through all of that, we need collaboration because as much as engineers can do, if we don't have comms people, if we don't have technical people who can actually do the work, if we don't have social and behavioral scientists who can drive the change, we're going to be stuck. So this, a bit like the scale of the change we want to achieve in carbon, we need to achieve that sort of change the entire way across our economy. 
across society. And I think the opportunities that come out of it for young people are just amazing. And certainly I know from talking to our own graduates and placement students this year, there is no generation more excited about working for a green company or trying to achieve the sort of change we're set out on. So why wouldn't we give them a really key and driving role in achieving it? Yeah, I mean, everything you said there is great. It's asking big questions also in education, how we educate anybody, to be honest. I mean, there's so many things we could go at, but I think that transversal skills as well as independent discipline skills are really a big challenge for all of us across architecture, built environment, engineering. And again, all the people generally everywhere has to buy into this, this vision and that's part of the TU challenge. Michael, I know you're under pressure with time. Did you want to say something quickly before you left? Yeah, um, thanks, Candy. Look, um, I think I see a, a question there from John around engaging with students and younger people. That's going to be one of the big challenges that we're going to have to figure out here. Um, the reality is that uh, young people don't need convincing. I think what they need to be given is the opportunity to uh, be agents for that change, if you know what I mean. And that's the challenge. One of the things that we're thinking about in terms of the whole behavioural change side, how we're going to do that. So that's a piece we have to pull together really significantly over the next few months in terms of our approach that we're looking at everything from soft to use assemblies digitally, literally, and right down to very simple sort of getting into the schools and, and conveying the messaging. But all that needs are people and resources to do it, if you know what I mean. So we have to, we have to, in a sense, optimize the use of the resources in terms of mobilizing that essential desire for change that's in all young people. And, and I can speak uh, at my age of young people being anything under 40, to be honest about it. Great, Michael. Yeah, no, thank you. And again, we have a big event tomorrow with over 700 students registered. They're typically going to be 50, 14, 15, 16, that sort of territory. So we need to bring them along and making a better world. Absolutely, we're very conscious of that. Another idea we have here in WIT is, and again, more is online, more Henry as well, in terms of making the city a living lab. So basically, very simply, every project and every every everything we everything we do in WIT and educating and training our people could be focused on city problems. And really, you could actually have a dovetail there between the new university and solving or helping to solve maybe some of the problems that the city have and challenges. So we're very anxious to get involved in that, Michael. Thanks very much. I, I'm going to finish up very shortly. And there's a question there from Owen, uh, or from Donald about to Owen about the district heating option that was in Dublin. It's a good example there of a public-private partnership. And he was wondering if if that could be done in Waterford. So Grace, I, I don't know in terms of capital funding from Europe, is that an option, or is it just going to have to be national funding in those cases? Or would you know? Um, no, I, I think it's uh, it's really important um, that district heating is um, factored in at this stage. But it might be better for Owen to talk about that because he has he, he's doing that, you know. Yeah. Um, but certainly, uh, there anything that's going in the green way uh, will be open for funding. Okay, thanks. Well, um, sorry. Yeah, um, I suppose one major obstacle with it is is that when you come into domestic housing. Um, district heating is not considered a renewable energy technology. So developers who were would consider doing this to bring district heating into a development would actually still have to do other methods or other measures to qualify for um, the or to be be compliant with Part L in the planning laws. So that, that's something that needs to change in the planning and maybe Mark and Grace in the political scene could actually bring that to cabinet to see right district heating is being discriminated against here we have a fantastic resource where we're taking waste heat from one source and bringing it to another source right now it's going to two government buildings uh, the Tala IT and the South Dublin Council offices there but it could also be brought into a new housing development just as easy um, if government actually changed the planning laws in terms of um, part L so that would be one thing they could do. And yes, planning, um, you, you would get funding for that through better energy communities it would be one scheme you could do it. But as I said at the outset, these types of district heating schemes are public private partnerships. They will not work without the council and government's involvement because they're too large infrastructural. There's too many places. If you look at the number, like we had to drive two kilometers of pipe down the Bellegarde Road in Dublin, unless you had council absolutely behind that, 
this would have taken 20 years to happen, you know, so that's a critical part of it. But as these data centers get built, and I know data centers are in everyone's mind at the moment because they're being blamed for using all electricity, like there's a huge amount of energy being lost in these data centers that can be captured using this technology. And, and the example, we have an example now in South Dublin there where that could be mirrored across the country to the other data centers that we have. Thanks, Owen. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, uh, we're under pressure with time. We're just got, we've just got over time, actually. So I'm going to try and wrap up. But before I finish, Nula just has a very nice question, a good question about um, behavioral change in relation to retail, clothing and textile waste and so on. So I think Michael in his road plan mentioned six different sectors within the city. And obviously that includes the retail sector, Nula. So I would expect that the, the roadmap for the city will, will, will hit everybody, will include everybody. That's the plan. Grace, you got your hand up there. You might want to add to that. Yeah, just really quickly, I mean, it's, it's about ecosystems thinking, really, and systemic thinking and that web of thinking of, of over, you know, of how we plan. So, I mean, for me, it's thinking about everything I do, carbon. I, so I'm thinking climate mitigation, climate adaptation, zero pollution, biodiversity protection, production and consumption, circular economy. And that pulls everything that we do. And I absolutely agree with Nula. I mean, fast fashion is a huge problem at the moment, you know? So, so there's, there's, there's loads for us to do, which for me is exciting and it's the challenge. But I think Michael pointed out his list, but that's my list. So every time, you know, something we're talking, looking at new policies, directing policy, then they're the kind of uh, criteria that I look at in order to guide me. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, I mean, it's daunting in some respects trying, when you get into the levels and the detail and so on. But having said that, the enthusiasm here today, we, we should make the first steps and, and, and go for what we can and, and work in a coherent way. So at this stage, I think we might bring the whole webinar to a close. As I said, we could probably talk for hours about the topic, but hopefully it advanced the journey to decarbonizing Waterford. Um, the ambition is to make this a reality by 2040, but uh, it will require a huge collective and coordinated approach. Uh, I think that's clear from today's event as well, uh, led by the City Council with active participation by obviously the new university, the business community, and indeed the citizens who live in, live in the city and rely on the city. Uh, so big, big challenge, but a big collective effort to, to make all this happen. As the minister pointed out at the start, we're of a size and a nature and a compactness, I suppose, that we have a great opportunity here in Waterford. So we're, we're, we're uniquely placed in that respect. And I think we're all looking forward to doing it in a way that makes Waterford an even better place to live. I know we've won this award or we've been recognized as a, a great place to live, but it could be even better. And let's, let's, let's be ambitious to make it even better than what it is at the moment. So I'm gonna just finish up by saying thank you to lots of people. First of all, a sincere thanks to our speakers today, to Michael, to Grace, to Owen, to Derek, to Kathleen and Mark. Thank you so much for all your contributions. Very much appreciated. A big thank you to our sponsors for today, which is Waterford City and County Council and the overall Toys for Engineers sponsor, Energia, who also obviously sponsored the Waterford Chamber, so very much appreciated. And that all helps. These are very important to uh, keeping everything going in, in our world. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone who's helped the development and delivery of Toys for Engineers over the last eight years, including Enterprise Ireland, the IDA, Waterford Enterprise Office, uh, Waterford Chamber Skillnet, Cobotics, Red Hat, Engineering the Southeast, Crystal Valley Tech, and Calmas. And I hope I haven't left anybody out because We've had so much help and continue to have a lot of help from a lot of people and organizations. Also, obviously, like to thank and congratulate the fantastic Waterford Chamber team of Gerald, Linda, Michael, Avril. Uh, they're all fantastic. The Chamber Directors, Niall Griffin and Jonathan Downey, and any frontline who are the technical people who have helped us put on this event here today to Dean and his colleagues. Uh, it takes a huge collective effort to get toys for engineers up and running each year, but it's having a very positive impact, we think, on, on the city and the, and the region and indeed nationally and hopefully contributing to making a better world. So finally, I'd like to thank all of you who've uh, attended today's session. Your participation is very much appreciated and the event will be uploaded later for those who want to watch it again, <laughs> or perhaps interested colleagues who couldn't make it today. At least, you know, hopefully you can share it with colleagues and get them also inspired and interested in this journey that we're all on. So thanks again, and hopefully we see each other soon, maybe even 3D as opposed to online, which would be nice. Um, and I think we're going to finish by playing out the Waterford Find Your Future video. So thanks for everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, guys.
the word cluster is very, very important because that signifies to anybody that's looking to come to the southeast that there are other opportunities for them. There's over 100, I believe, tech companies at the moment based within Waterford and in the southeast region. That as well as a wonderful quality of life, the fact that there were so many opportunities and so many different global companies within Waterford that people could move around. Waterford Find Your Future, it's a very realistic statement to make. We've now managed to grow and scale our business to a staff of over 60 and we've done all that based within Waterford so there most definitely is a future for companies or for people if they choose Waterford as their base. You know, there's so much here, like it's, you know, I feel very fortunate to be living here, tremendous support. We've great staff, all local, um, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a great spot to live. So I was born and bred here and uh, lived um, uh, in a lot of places around the world, but uh, was fortunate to get to come back to Waterford and um, continue our, our family business. It's a fantastic place to live. You know, you're, you're, we're four miles from the sea. You've Tremor, Dunmore, you've the Cumra Mountains. We employ about 800 people here in Waterford. The company is about 100,000 people worldwide. Why was Waterford selected? It's a great location, good infrastructure, road and rail for both people and product. It's cost competitive, but mostly we came to Waterford for the people. In terms of bringing up a family, Waterford has a huge amount to offer. Great schools, both junior and senior cycles, Waterford is Ireland's best kept secret in terms of quality of life. Waterford has certainly been a pivotal part of the company's success. Uh, we kind of often joke locally about it being an unkept secret. Uh, we're working with some of the top health systems in the United States. We've got a quite a diverse population in Waterford. Uh, we as a company have employed people with multilingual expertise, you know, speaking multiple different languages. Waterford people have a, a very strong work ethic, have great communication skills, good problem solving skills. You know, find your future in Waterford. I think there's lots of opportunities, uh, whatever your interests are, you know, if it's sport, if it's the music scene, if it's the cultural scene. Um, we've got all of that in abundance, so I think, uh, yeah, Waterford, it's a, a good place to live, work and, you know, actually grow your career as well.